Earlier today, I finished Robert O. Paxton's Vichy France Old Guard and New Order 1940-1944, and I found his conclusion to be especially interesting. He wrote this book in 1972, and since he wrote at a time when there had been enough distance between the World War II period and the present, there was enough time to really assess things in a broader lens without losing the immediacy of the moment. In other words, there was still living history. Most of the people who were talking about World War II in the 70s had actually experienced it. So it was an interesting moment in history. And it's a perspective that we can't really recapture without revisiting these older books like this. I assume this book's been out of print for a while and that it's not easily accessible. So I will read the final section called A Moral Balance Sheet so that way you can determine if this book is right for you or not. So, page 380 to page 383, a moral balance sheet. There is finally a grave moral case to be made against the Vichy elite. There is, first of all, the charge of using the defeat of 1940 for narrowly sectarian purposes, to seek revenge upon the popular front and to remake France along new lines, no less partisan than the old, and in the service of narrower interest. This does not mean that they had plotted the defeat of France in advance, but their domestic enmities were so all-consuming after four years of the Popular Front and its successors that they committed the most elementary of political errors. They wrote new laws under an armed foreign occupation. There is also the charge of abetting the further internal division of France. No other major occupied country entered the war so torn. No other major occupied country used the occupation as the occasion for such a substantial restructuring of domestic institutions. When biographies of Marshal Patan began to appear in 1966, it became regular practice to blame the poisons of division attending the liberation upon de Gaulle's rigorous sectarianism and the upwelling of revenge encouraged by resistance lawlessness. A will to healing reconciliation coexisted within the liberation forces alongside a well-justified determination to purge and punish the collaborators, however. It was most visible in the Liberation Army, a successful amalgam of Armistice Army, Free French, and Force Francais Libre under two ex petanisti officers. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce those two names. One is, well, I'll just say it. You can figure it out if you know how French works. You have to have a sinus infection to pronounce it correctly, of course. Marshals de Latra de Tassigny and Juin, and one Gaullist officer, Leclerc, and there's more to his name, but he is often just called Leclerc, so we'll just go with that. If that will to reconciliation did not prevail over the will to revenge in 1944, it was very largely because the Vichy regime had not been the mere caretaker regime in 1940 and 1944 that its defenders claim. Vichy waged another round in the virtual French Civil War of the 1930s. Then, its geopolitical gamble having failed, and war having ended neither in German victory nor in a French-mediated compromise, but in total Allied victory, Vichy reaped the winds of sectarian passion that it had sown. I assume that when talking about the virtual Civil War of the 30s, he meant 40s, but it was just a typo. That would make a lot more sense, given the history of the period. There is, finally, the issue of complicity. Continually repurchasing its sovereign, uh, shadow sovereignty at a higher and higher price, the Vichy regime made many Frenchmen accomplices in acts and policies that they would not normally have condoned. Marshal Patan, in particular, was a figure to whom millions of Frenchmen looked with more than usual confidence. After the total occupation of France in November 1942, or at least after the constitutional crisis of November to December 1943, it was time to cease lending the stamp of one's approval to an enterprise that no longer worked. Old age is a shipwreck, as de Gaulle observed, but Germans who met Patan in 1943 still found him fresh and alert. Moreover, he was surrounded by men whose brilliance of preparation and of administrative career made them superior to the Third Republic leadership of the late 1930s. These able and intelligent men led other Frenchmen deeper into complicity with the besieged Third Reich's last desperate paroxysms. 
the final solution, forced labor, reprisals against a growing resistance. What can explain such egregious choices? Tactical motives, the hope of saving France from worse, cannot explain the complicity after November 1942. Of the four elements composing the Vichy bargaining position, military defeat, continuation of others in the war, the stranglehold of German occupation upon the richest two-thirds of France, and the exclusion from German grasp of the French fleet and empire, only the last one was ever within Vichy's control. After the total occupation of France, the scuttling of the French fleet, and the return of French North Africa to war in November 1942, Vichy no longer had even that leverage. Life was clearly no easier for Frenchmen by then than for the totally occupied Western European countries. Clearly, other motives led Frenchmen deeper into that final complicity. Bureaucratic inertia and blindness to considerations beyond the efficiency of the state were among them. Beyond that was the attraction of the national revolution for its partisans. At bottom, however, lay a more subtle intellectual culprit, fear of social disorder as the highest evil. Some of France's best skill and talent went into a formidable effort to keep the French state afloat under increasingly questionable circumstances. Who would keep order, they asked, if the state lost authority? By saving the state, however, they were losing the nation. Those who, clung, or those who cling to the social order above all may do so by self-interest or merely by inertia. In either case, they know more clearly what they are against than what they are for. So blinded, they perform jobs that may be admirable in themselves, but are tinctured with evil by the overall effects of the system. Even Frenchmen of the best intentions, faced with the harsh alternative of doing one's job, whose risks were moral and abstract, or practicing civil disobedience, whose risks were material and immediate, went on doing the job. The same may be said of the German occupiers. Many of them were, quote, good Germans, men of cultivation, confident that their country's success outweighed a few moral blemishes, dutifully fulfilling some minor blameless function in a regime whose cumulative effect was brutish. Readers will prefer, like the writer, to recognize themselves in neither of these types. It is tempting to identify with resistance and say, that is what I would have done. Alas, we are far more likely to act in parallel situations like the Vichy majority. Indeed, it may be the German occupiers rather than the Vichy majority whom Americans as residents of the most powerful state on earth, should scrutinize most, unblinkingly, scrutinize most unblinkingly. The deeds of occupier and occupied alike suggest that there are some, that there come cruel times when to save a nation's deepest values, one must disobey the state. France after 1940 was one of those times.